you go. There you go. Well, yeah. um, Brett, uh, thanks for joining us here. I think people have heard a lot from Scott and myself this morning, so um, I figured we'd just start it off and talk about some of your recent trades here. I mean, you've, uh, we, we should have some sort of tagline for you when the VIX is over 20, Brett's trading plenty or something cheesy like that because <laughs> you, cer you certainly make a lot of cheese and cheddar when you're uh, above that 20 level in the VIX. So um, you want to run us through some of your recent activity here and kind of the mindset behind it, I guess. Yeah, sure. I mean, I guess the main thing that I would say is I've, I've, to people who've been on the service maybe just for, you know, let's say a year or less, um, you've heard me say over and over again that when the VIX goes up, the other thing that goes up is something that I call serial correlation, which just means, you know, the market is correlated to itself through time. So it's a higher signal-to-noise ratio for technical signals. Um, people start moving as a crowd, as a herd. Uh, this is largely because the the price action, the, the, the breadth of the moves, the width of the moves, the size of the moves, uh, makes everybody feel like something really important is happening. And the whole situation is so uncertain that um, I, people have an instinct that when things are really uncertain and really important together at the same time, we just have a natural instinct to key off each other. And the way that that translates into markets is really defined pattern structure. People start to react to what's just happened as a sign of information about the world. Oh, everybody's selling. I don't know why, but I need to sell too. Or, oh, everybody's buying now. I don't know why, but I need to buy too. And that fact means that when the market is like that, it's much easier to trade if you're able to transport yourself outside of that dynamic and look back on it. As, as, a, as a dissociated part of that crowd, where you're an observer, you're able to react to what the crowd is doing without following the crowd or being kind of caught up in that herd mentality. And it's the reason why I tend to trade a lot more when the VIX is like that, because, you know, I think that you should, you should be most aggressive when you feel like the odds are most stacked in your favor and be least aggressive when they're not. And for me, there's no question about it. When that sort of process starts to take hold, I find the market very, very easy to trade. I said yesterday it was like fish in a barrel, and hopefully I demonstrated that to some extent. Um, you know, I, 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 I'm long now, uh, and, and I, I suppose you've had the – I've gathered – from comments I've read as well as stuff I've heard you say that the fact that yesterday's rally was sparked by, it appears to be anyways, or at least helped catalyzed by uh, some China-US trade stuff, um, suggests that maybe it won't have as much follow through. And I tend to lean in that same direction. Um, so I'm not really necessarily looking for anything too big with the other piece that I have on right now. But um, I'm letting it run. I think that it will move over yesterday's highs. And if we get up to maybe 28.10, 28.15, I'll probably take the other half off then. But otherwise, yeah, it's just been a time of just being really active. Yeah, I, I mean, um, you know, obviously it was a nice bounce yesterday, and I, I still thought um, earnings would be a key read. So, um, you know, that's why I probably was, wasn't as excited, and it sounds like you're in that camp. I guess my question then would be, so you've left your stops at the entry, which is basically the bottom of the market here. Do right. you view that as a potential bottom then, since you have not moved your stops off from that at all? Or, um, I mean, obviously it's still pretty early in that. Uh, what would make you adjust those stops or perhaps even cover uh, this position at the moment? Well, so, like I said, I've got a target. And I tend to, in a situation where you've got a volatile market like this, I, I think from the standpoint of here's, here's, how I, here's how I define the job, the job that I do when I sit down to trade. The job is to close the door to big losses and open the door to big gains. And what the market does, that's its job. My job is to do that. My job is to close the door to big losses and to open the door to big gains. And the market will do its job or it won't. But in a probabilistic spread, um, I like to think in terms of you know a 1,000 parallel universes. As long as I put myself in setups, where the majority of those potential universes contain something good, and I do my job by cutting off big losses and opening the door to big gains, then net-net over any large sample of trades, I'm going to come out on top, and probably a lot on top. Um, so when I deal with a stop like this, really, I don't want to, I, I want to give it room 
but I don't want to take a loss on the trade at this point, and I'm going to let it run. I've got a target. I've got a reasonable understanding of what I think it should do here. What I think it should do is poke above yesterday's highs. So probably I will seven eighty five. I mean, you know, yeah. I mean, I've got what on the S and P. I've got twenty eight hundred, right? Uh, yesterday's highs. Basically, twenty seven ninety nine. Yeah, twenty seven ninety eight seventy five. So if I see a blowout short side stops above 2,800, and let's just say there's probably a lot of stops around there, um, you know, I'm going to look for a 2,806, 2,808, 2,809, something like that. But I'll watch it. I'll watch how the, the character, like I've always said, levels are important, but they're not as important as the mode. The mode of behavior is the most important thing. If it grinds slowly up there on no new headlines, it doesn't slam through that level. It just charges gradually through it by, you know, volume coming in, plotting higher, and it looks like a robust, slow-moving, gradual trend, I'll probably leave it on. But if it, you know, zips up to that level and then splashes through with a big bar that just, just goes from 2801 to 2809 in about 10 seconds, I will be out on that. So I'm trying to take advantage of mechanical dynamics that can help me, but at the same time, I'm not going to ignore robust movement. If it starts to act right, um, you know, a slow, gradual move where it looks like the bigger money is sitting on the bid, it's a thick bid, um, and it's just, it's the floor moving up, like the faucet has suddenly turned back on, because right now, it looks like the faucet is on the other direction. It looks like there's, for whatever reason, and we can talk about the reasons, and I think we should, but for whatever reason, it looks like there's just a wave of distribution happening right now. We're not seeing the put call get up too high. It's up actually a little higher this morning than you think it would be. But, you know, it's starting to move back down now. But it has not. We haven't seen that, you know, that 150, 160, 170 kind of print on put call that makes you think that people are interested in ensuring things that they want to continue to own. Instead, what we're seeing is selling. Right. right. It's not a scramble for hedges against some kind of potential boogeyman. It's just selling. And when you get just selling, you need to take note. So um, this is, this is uh, if I see just buying, if I see that dynamic reverse and I see the sense of, you know, there's just money starting to come into the market in a plodding, gradual, mechanically driven kind of manner, you know, then I think that, um, you know, I'll probably just let it run. And, and we'll, we'll just see where it goes. Maybe we will gradually grind all the way back up. But my guess is that's not what we're going to see. So I, I'm, I'm waiting to see that flush out above 2,800, and I'm waiting to see it look like a bunch of shorts are getting shaken out of a position and finally giving up in a situation where we're probably going to see distribution come after that. And I'll take advantage of it. I'll get out, and I'll probably look to start shorting again. Um, now, you did try to take a shot at the NASDAQ. Was that more or less a hedge against the gains that you have that you had just trying to preserve gains in the S&P trade? Or um, was there something particular that you saw in that pattern? Which which one? The Nasdaq short that you yeah, had. Yeah, so that was a, that was a very specific pattern, um, very short time frame chart. Where, he, so so, I saw that distribution coming in again, and I saw it get bottled up around the level. We went about six or seven minutes trying to push through the level, and we got one little poke higher, and that suggests to me very short-term traders getting shaken out of shorts where they got too levered up because you get five, six minutes pounding on the same level. You tend to get this little poke bar, but the poke bar is just a shakeout bar, and one of the best short setups you can have, really, 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 really short-term scalp kind of framework is to short those poke bars when you get a level bounded up like that. Like we had along 7120 in the NASDAQ. We went along it for about six minutes, five minutes, just hitting it, bouncing two points, three points, eight points up, hitting it again, doing the same thing over and over. And then we bounced 20 points off it. And I think that's just people just started to push too hard on the level. And there was somebody sitting there just soaking it up. You bounce off it. You short that poke bar. You're always going to get a retest. So the beauty of that setup is, and it's really a, a, a nuanced setup. You have to be very quick. But the beauty is you get positioned at, you know, 71.40, 71.35. It's going to go back down and test 71.20. That's just a guarantee. And, you know, the question in my mind is, does it flush through at that point? If so, I'm covering a piece at 71.05, covering a piece at 70.90. I'm moving my stops up. It went down, tested 71.20. 
held for two minutes and then just started to rally. So at that point, I'm just going to give up on it. It's not what I'm looking for. Um, and you know that's that's just a little intricate scalp setup that I've I've used a number of times, and it didn't work in this case. But that's fine because you know it allowed me to do again the job that I named, right? I closed the door to big losses and opened the door to big gains. That ended up a scratch. Yeah, no, all good points there. Um, what do you think of this uh, recent activity going on in terms of uh, we we saw a break below that twenty seven sixty five level to um, about twenty seven. 60, but then uh, it seems like people came in to buy it pretty quickly here. You got any thoughts on that action? Which one? 21, uh, 27.60? Yeah, for the S&P, just yeah, over I mean, the last hour. I, I mean, I personally thought that that was pretty impressive that they were able to hold at the 27.60 area um, at, at the moment, and then just when, as we were talking here, just rolling through the put call ratio and um, the VIX and everything, starting to see the put call dip back below one, yeah, that right. VIX has slid back down to 21, and starting to see financials um, find a little bit of support down here at the 2640 level, just looking at the XLF. Um, some of these, uh, you know, JP Morgan settled a little bit here down at 108. Uh, the KRE, which is the regional ETF, is, um, you know, that's settling a little bit at 56.40. So, uh, are you reading any, anything into this action over the last hour? Uh, so, I'll say this. I think that we are now in a context that I like to call a correction of a correction. So, you got a correction going, it's to the downside. That correction is continuing. I don't think that we've seen the lowest lows of that. But we are now in the correction to the upside of that correction to the downside. So it's two degrees of muddle. I think you're going to see, I, I think today is not going to pay off the way yesterday did for an aggressive style where you're looking to play big size, fast and loose, uh, two directions, aggressive right that was yesterday that was that was perfect for yesterday i think that you have to make the mental switch and say today you know you may see a lot of pattern failures you may see a lot of chop you're going to be in the in the kind of the the grinding gears of a correction of a correction where you've got a lot of different technical crosswinds um, so you're going to have people playing the bounce who got stopped out last couple days don't want to miss because the headlines in CNBC and Bloomberg and Wall Street Journal and Financial Times are all about the bounces on. And this has been a sharp correction in a long bull market. Everybody that uh, Scott talked about yesterday, you know, turning around and getting really bearish quickly on the correction, suddenly, you know, they've sold everything and now they're looking to try to get back in. So you've got that bid that's going to be underneath the market. It may not be a dependable bid. It may not be a bid that you really want to rest on, but it's going to be there and it's going to gum up the works for shorts. At the same time, you've got this faucet is on kind of distribution coming down on top of the market. And those two things are colliding right now. And it's going to be tough to to really see this, you know, this this great blossoming of the flower of a position when you put it on. Um, you're going to get a lot of little chunky stop outs. I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm quick to look at this pattern right now. I kind of feel like this pull to start shorting the NASDAQ right now. But I'm, I'm going to lay off just for the reasons that I just described. Um, I kind of want to do it, but I'm not going to do it. I've got the S&Ps long. You could just see, if you just look at, look at a one-minute chart since the open. You know, you've just got, look at the NASDAQ. It's just a, it's just a back and forth. I mean, that's actually a 50-point range. That's not too bad, but, I mean, it just, it feels like there's a, one failure, one side, people trying to get in, trying to catch the breakout, failing, getting kicked out to the other side, sending people in, looking for the other side. It fails, it gets kicked out, goes back to the middle. It's just back and forth like that. And I think it's just caught between these sort of, you know, these these intermediate versus short-term opposing forces. And it's probably going to be pretty messy today and maybe Monday as well. And then what we really need is the move that I said I was looking for. We need that move to jet out through yesterday's highs and to see that fail. Probably, just from a trader standpoint, that's probably the thing that leads to the best trading is you 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 clear out your longs on that breakout above yesterday's highs it turns out to be a technical phenomenon not too dependable it fails it starts to roll back over that will give us the ability to make another lower low relative to yesterday's lows maybe on Tuesday or Wednesday that could be a 
you know, maybe a, a something that can bottom us through toward the holidays, you know, and then we'll see what we get coming into Q1. But then you're looking, um, I mean, then you're looking at, like, why this may be really happening. And, uh, you know, I'd like to talk about that a little bit if you want to. Sure, sure. I, I mean, you're, you're pointing out a little bit more forward-looking outlook, basically. I just think that, you know, I mean, the market is, this is this doesn't feel like, uh, you know, a short-term dynamic scare. And I'm not trying to get too bearish here. You know, I, there's still, like, tremendous fundamental trends. Earnings growth is fantastic. You know, interest rates have been popping higher on a long-term scale. It's not really that high. But, yeah. There's a possibility that we're seeing some kind of peak. You know, we've recently gone through a period of some kind of peak sense of, of the positive impact of a lot of things that are going to be generally deteriorating to some extent over the next few quarters. And it could be that that's why this feels like it's not really headline-driven on the downside, but it's, it's, it's the market readjusting. And um, I would say one of those things is that this is probably the zone, Q3 of this year is probably the zone of, of the absolute maximum impact of a lot of the fiscal stimulus measures that we've taken because it's not just about how much the tax cuts give people. It's not just about how much deregulation gives people. It's about the psychological reaction to that. It's about people making new plans and making new investments. So when they see the advantage that those sorts of measures give them, they have a, oh, the world is going to get better feeling, and they start to do lots of hiring, lots of borrowing, lots of spending, lots of investing. Right, and and you can economists can kind of look at what the typical maybe life cycle of that process is, and if you don't get a new round of new fiscal stimulus measures, what we would call a second derivative increase, if you don't get that, then you're pulling growth forward by those types of decisions that would maybe happen otherwise, but it starts to all get piled in, and maybe it's all gotten piled in basically to this Q2 Q3 period. And what, what's GDP for Q3 going to be? What do you think when, all, when the dust settles? Um, I haven't seen too many estimates, but I believe it's supposed to be running around three and a half, right? I thought that it was above four. No? Is it above four? I, well, I know that there was some upward uh, revisions because of inventory, uh, the inventory data that we Either had way, today. highest of the cycle, probably, yeah. right? Yeah. So, um, you know, and that kind of, you know, we're talking about, peak ideas here and you got, if peak we get earnings, this, you got peak GDP and uh, right and if you get uh, the Dems taking the house right and from what I see that is the polling leads to the baseline I, yeah seven out of nine or something chances um, yeah so let's say the market is just working off of that assumption now Dems take the house so you've got a Trump looking to be reelected in 2020 that's the guy we have in 2019. And as we know, in the United States, presidential election campaign season starts almost two years ahead of the election. Right. So we're talking about, you know, middle of next year is really going to be about the election the following year, all the way through, pretty much. And if, you know, if, if, if the Republicans were to win the House... I can promise you there would be new fiscal stimulus measures coming out of the table into that. Yeah. And the market's aware of that. So either it gets another tax cut and a bunch more deregulations and who knows what else, or it doesn't based on this election. It's not a political decision. The market's not saying it likes Republicans or Democrats more it's, on a moral basis or something. It's just where, where are earnings going to be higher over the short term over the next 12 to 18 months, probably if the GOP wins the House, simply because there's going to be that that push for new fiscal stimulus measures. And if the Dems win the House, it's not going to be there. So the fiscal stimulus channel is peaking right now, probably, in the market's best estimate. Um, and then you've got this massive jump in interest rates. And as we talked about, you've got $1.5 trillion of supply coming on in 2019 and a huge corporate refi cycle. So, you know, the benefit of low interest rates in terms of uh, – Big corporations hiring and spending a lot is peaking right now too. So there's a you, you got you, as you said the earnings cycle may be peaking. You've got right. the impact of the fiscal stimulus peaking borrowing for a long time to come, and then you've got yeah the impact of low interest rates peaking as well. All kind of right now. So it may just be that the market is kind of you know assuming that. 
2018 Q3 is kind of a, a peak moment as far as the cycle's ability to produce yeah, I would, I would a great outlook. I would 100% agree with that. Just a quick aside, but uh, I see St. Louis uh, real GDP forecast for Q3 is 4.5%. That's just crossing wires now. Yeah, I can see that being a peak for the cycle. That could definitely be a peak for the cycle. I think everybody would expect that because, especially when you start talking about the tougher year-over-year -year comps, right? I, I, I mean, th yes. think, th think, think about think of what Q you're going to be Q3 in Q3 2019. Because, th number one, and we saw it today in the Chinese trade balance data, the pull forward of orders, where, um, you know, the September Chinese trade balance came in at a surplus of $31 billion against expectations of $19 billion, and that's because exports rose 15% year over year because everybody was just stocking the shelves with stuff that they need from China ahead of tariffs. That's just a comp nightmare, right? So yeah, it's a total comp nightmare. For I mean, I you know, it's one of those right. things that so the market's being you all smart. That much. Yeah, the market's being a little smart right now, and maybe right. I mean, it's catching people by surprise because it's not because of some, you know, new headline theme. But that's the more dependable way to to look at this. And and I think that the the best measure for me will be on this bounce, on this correction of a correction situation. Do we see? Just like Scott mentioned um, uh, 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 yesterday morning, the, the AAII data showed a jump toward bearishness after the bad Wednesday. What if we see a shallow bounce and a big jump toward bullishness? Like, that's the type of signal that can suggest that you're in trouble. So it will be interesting to see if over the weekend we get the robo ratio spike back toward bullishness without much of a bounce. Um, we grind sideways, we get to 28.10, go back to 27.75, and next week's AAII is a jump toward bullishness. Those kinds of things can really be big red flags. It gives the sense that there is this faucet. Uh, it's just like when you see a uh, move up, but bulls never show up. You know that move's going to extend, right? Like It yeah. just shows that there's more work to do before you capitulate whatever that directional idea is. And if we get a big jump back toward bullishness without much of a bounce, it's going to be a big red flag here. And we're just going to have to be smart about it. Right now, I'm long the market because I got such a spectacular entry yesterday that I'm not going to give it up. I'm not going to, to be too aggressive about profit taking. I'm going to let it play out where I think it's going to go. And maybe it will go further, and I'm going to give it that chance. But I'm a skeptical long willing to let it go right now. Yeah. Um what uh, so I know we got CFTC data coming out uh, later on this afternoon. Is there anything that you'd be looking for? Is probably too early to really get a good judgment in terms of positioning and some of the futures for the indices. You know I don't like um, CFTC that much for stocks. Okay. Um, I just find that there's you know, there's too many too many. Uh, complicating factors in terms of too many different ways for people to be involved in stocks. So like, as far as financial players, for something like, um, you know, copper, like yeah. you're either going to have a warehouse full of copper or you've got to play the futures. So with stocks, you know, you've got the shares and the options and derivative notes and all sorts of things. So when you're looking at the CFTC data, you're looking at such a, a small cross-section of participation that it's tough to make any big judgment calls. So I look at the sentiment surveys more instead. Okay. Which we will be getting uh, plenty out next week. So we got the Empire out next week, Philly Philly Fed. So um, yeah. be, well, I meant uh, the, the exposure, like the AAII, et cetera. But yeah, no, as far as the economy, yeah, that's going to be awfully interesting. Yeah, um, particularly from a forward-looking standpoint. Yes. Um, and now, exactly for the theory we just said, is if this is a peak period and we start to see you know, any softness there start to come in over the next, say, two months, that's a big red flag as well. Yeah. Um, so being a uh, macro trader, I know you do a lot of top-down. Um, trading. Is there any, what, what asset classes would you be looking at? I mean, obviously some of the initial distribution you'd been following a lot in the euro, the dollar naturally having a big impact. I know you, you were playing gold a little bit there. Um, yeah. Are you looking at any, and, and you still have that 30-year bond short end, correct? Yes, I do. Um, is there any reads that you're trying to gain from them to help you kind of figure out the indices a little bit? 
Yeah, I mean, um, I think one tell is that when the U.S. when U.S. stock market's getting hit over the last few days, the dollar is getting hit too, and I think that's interesting. Uh, because typically we would see the opposite. The dollar is the most liquid possible thing that you can have, and usually when people are scared or in some kind of panic, there is a flight into the most liquid thing you can have because that gives you maximum optionality. And generally speaking, uncertainty drives people toward maximum optionality. And to see the dollar weaken out of this situation, just you know, there's some suggestion there of maybe what we talked about with the... Um, with the midterm elections being a factor right now, particularly, because the dollar has been buoyed by the idea that the United States has access to and the political will to um, enact fiscal stimulus measures this late in the cycle, which is a, a very unique and, and, and unusual thing to do. With 3.7% unemployment and rising interest rates and uh, basically you know, everybody who wants a job, getting a job, and keeping a job. It's very, very strange to be doing fiscal stimulus at that point um, because of the risk of inflation. So the United States is the only country in the world doing anything like that, and one of the reasons for that is because of the political situation here. Um, having a president that wants to do that and having the same party control both houses of Congress, that has been, I think, the principal factor that has been helping the dollar when it's outperformed, um, that that pushes interest rates up. It forces the Fed to be tighter than they've been. I mean, it's kind of ironic to see the president coming after the Fed about raising rates when the reason why the Fed has to raise rates is because of the fiscal stimulus the White House is doing. So, you know, the fiscal stimulus forces the rates higher, forces the Fed's hand, forces the currency up. If you get the Dems taking the House um, and you get a second derivative decline in that same political will and a capacity to enact more fiscal stimulus, then it suggests a weak dollar ahead. So you should see a correlation between the dollar and stocks, which is relatively unusual, and that's what we're seeing now. So yeah, so that would be, you know, the the, the weakness is you're seeing um, the dollar decline, and when we're bouncing, you're seeing the dollar bounce as well. So it's it's an interesting situation. You following the Chinese Yuan at all? Yeah, to some extent. I mean, it's a you know, it, it, it's it's predictable what's happened, and I don't follow it on a short time frame, but I watch it over the course of, you know, where is it today, where is it tomorrow, um, and obviously, you know, again, it's you know, it's funny because it's the White House criticizing them for depreciating the currency, but the reason why they're doing it is because of what the White House yes. is doing. Yeah, I mean, it's it's you know, it's, it's yeah, there's no direct tariff. correlation that it's down ten percent with the ten percent tariffs, right? I mean, how else are you going to remain competitive? You know, you they, if you have to add something to the price, you decrease the denominator of the price. And of course, we got the Treasury Secretary report coming out next week, but it doesn't look like they'll be named as oh, yeah. a manipulator. Not not that that's a major thing for the markets one way or the other. I thought just keeping was the peace on the table, right? Yeah, they, exactly. They need to be able to that. <laughs> well, I, I thought uh, Mnuchin, uh, the interview with FT that he had earlier in the week, where he noted that they would like to tie the yuan devaluation into trade talks. I thought that was pretty much going to be all that they would do at that point. That served as the warning, if you will, rather than yeah, going, mean, going down the manipulator. If you, if you do it now, then you've got no ammo left to, to do it next. Yeah, I mean, but I, I guess the whole sticks and stones, <laughs> names will never hurt me. Uh, yeah. Big plays, right. and I don't know what being named a manipulator really does in terms Unless of... Unless uh, it were to impact, like, inclusion in bond fund indices or something. Yeah. That would be That would be a big blow for China, and the question is, you know, can that be tied together? And I don't think that it can, but that would be big. Yeah, just uh, taking a quick look, Brett, while we're talking here. Um, there's a NetEase headline coming across that Baidu uh, is making a strategic investment in NetEase cloud music. So uh, something we'll keep an eye out on here. Um, NTES is NetEase, of course. So uh, something of interest there. 
Uh, so what else you got for us then, Brett? What, what, what are you looking at here? I mean, I think you've pretty much been thorough on what you're looking for in both the S&P and the NASDAQ. Is there any other trading setups, um, be it uh, in the bonds or in gold? Gold. That you're... Let's talk gold. The, yeah, let's talk gold. Yeah, I missed gold. Yeah. Huh? Uh, well, I want to know what your yeah, I want to know what your opinion is on that yet breakout yesterday. No, I know you've been yes. bullish on it, but I mean, it was, it was definitely safety oriented, right? It was disaster hedging move in gold, and that's not what I was looking for. And you know, I mean, I mean, if it, it, it may be, it may be that that's what it was. Maybe that that was the thing that I needed to move on. Yeah. It's just I was looking for a more let's just say uh, intrinsic and organic kind of change in gold that would have been, that would have signaled something to me. But, you know, hey, it happened. And there it goes, and it, you know, it did kind of what I was looking for as far as the individual chart dynamics. Once it got through uh, 12, 15, it was off and running. And, um, you know, there was that, that pot of gold down there. So No pun intended, will, right? Yeah, right, exactly. There's that treasure. <laughs> that treasure chest. Once you dig down to 1215, you hit treasure, and there it goes. Um, but, yeah, like I, it was imbalanced. There was too much short interest. As we talked about, it's got the most short interest on a speculative basis in, like, 18 years coming into yesterday. And I would imagine that people who were shorting it the way that they're shorting gold in 1998 and 1999, the idea of a disinflationary positive economic boom, with no problems anywhere on the horizon, people who were just sitting short that, looking for rising real interest rates, right? Not rising inflation, rising real interest rates. Um, they can hedge with bonds, they can make the coupons, and they can ride the, the great times uh, forward, and there's no reason to own gold. People who were short gold on that kind of basis had to balance out when we start to see a, a market crash. So I don't really... I don't really see it as quite the same dynamic, but if you look at the chart and just, you know, you focus on nothing else, you know, there it goes. So if you if you are still long it, certainly stay long it. Hey, hey, Brett, just to decide, since we're talking about the GD for, uh, GDP forecast, then my Fed's out with the 2.25. <laughs> so, oh, my goodness. For Q3. For Q3, so uh, that's obviously exactly half of the 4.5 that the St. Louis Fed was. So, um, How can it, that be? I, I, I don't know. You, you wonder what they're talking about at the table for rate rate hikes, right? Oh, my goodness, <laughs> right. Yeah, I wonder if that's like the biggest divergence there's ever been. How I, could I there know, be? Yeah. That's extraordinary. I wonder if there's one factor that they're disagreeing on that's a, just a big factor, like inventory or something. Yeah, yeah, I don't know, but it's certainly an oddity. Yeah, okay, that's interesting. Um, so with, uh, with with that gold, too, is there any uh, derivative trades off that nugget, GDX? Anything well, I mean, else? they're all moving in real time, right? So if you miss yeah. gold, you miss those. I mean, yeah, you know, if we had still had that dust short, look at that thing. Hit 30 yesterday, 42 to 30 in the last couple of days. It's a pretty nice short. But, yeah, I mean, you know, it, it comes back down to the thing that I've talked about a number of times is falsifiability. So if I were to buy gold right now, I wouldn't know where to sell it if I was wrong, right? That's the problem right. at this point. Because if it drops because the stock market is bouncing and, you know, it moves back down to 1210, you know, am I wrong now? But I'm, you know, 20 points down. At what point do I give up on it now? other than just by saying I've got a dollar amount I'm willing to lose. But it doesn't say anything about it being wrong. Right. Um, so it just, you know, and hey, look, uh, you don't have to take every setup. You don't have to make money in every market that's moving. You take the setups that work for you, that match your personality, that fit with your style. Make sure you catch those, um, and you don't have to do anything else. So if it decides to move back into a configuration, on all levels that I like, I'll get it. All right. Let's talk this. What's Brett Manning doing and looking for over the next week? Well, I pretty much told you. Um, I, well, the main thing that I'm looking to do is keep an open mind and be willing to take the setups that smack me in the face. Now that the VIX is up, now that it's moving, I think you just need to watch, relax, and say, oh, I've seen this before. I know what's about to happen, and then take it. And not have too many 
pre-existing assumptions about what's going to happen. I think that I understand what's going to happen, but if I see something that I've seen a hundred times before and it gives me a sense that I know what's going to happen, then that's what I'm going to do. And there's just, it's really easy money in a market like that. And there's no reason to cut yourself off from making the easy money when it's there. So the main thing to do is to not have too much of a fixed assumption about what's going to happen, not be too married to any kind of view, and just watch for short-term setups because they can really run in a market like this. It doesn't need to be a big grand idea. If it's a good short-term setup, you can make a quick you know, 30, 50, 100 points. Just let it happen. All right. Um, and anything with earnings that you're going to be particularly looking for? Well, more, you know, just kind of the evolution of the, the top-down view, like how good are earnings, how good is I, – I suppose, um, you know, any hints toward what I want to talk to you about as we get a couple weeks into earnings season is any sense of hints toward, uh, you know, how fiscal 2019 is looking for people, any kind of longer-range – sense of guidance. Are they starting to recognize any kind of headwinds because of needing to roll over a lot of debt? Anything like that. So um, I, we know earnings are going to be really good uh, nominally for Q3. The question is, um, are they getting more aggressive looking into next year? I mean, the, and, and, and whether or not they say they are versus, you know, how they kind of report the details of that kind of sense. Yeah, it's funny because so, that's not really in their nature, though, right? They usually tend to like to be cautious just to give themselves a little wiggle room, right? Well, so there you may have a counterintuitive kind of signal. Yeah. It's counterintuitive on the stage that you think that they could be sandbagging and people would see through that? or Oh, no, no. <laughs> that That... If they think that things are going to be tough over the next year, maybe they won't sandbag because they don't want people to sell the stock today. Yeah, yeah no, that's, that's definitely true. So uh, there'll, there'll, there'll be some uh, reading in between the uh, leaves there, right? Yeah, I mean, I just remember listening to steel company conference calls in Q1 2008. That was striking. I, I think it was Q1. Maybe it's Q2. I, that was just one of the most striking moments to hear these guys talking about how incredible business was going to be when they were used to sandbagging every quarter. And just, it was just this, I don't know why the stock is going down. It's never been better. And, and underneath the surface, we know now that their businesses were just completely falling apart. Yeah. So it, it was an interesting kind of study in how to handle conference calls when things are going poorly in, you know, in some cases. Not in every case, but, you know, I mean, they're going to be strategic. Yeah, be adults. I agree. Um, all right, Brett, you got anything else that you'd like to add in at this point? No, I think we're good. Just uh, like I said, keep an open mind. This is a good market. Yeah, well, I'm sure we'll uh, be having you on audio a lot next week. Uh, hopefully this fix stays over 20 and keeps giving some opportunities, right? Yes. All right, well, Brett, hey, great trading out there, and uh, I'm sure all the subs appreciate um, the uh, calls that you've had this week. Certainly, I've uh, been making some people money there, and uh, always appreciate your insight into the markets. You got it. Thanks, Gab. All right, no problem at all. We'll talk to you soon. All right.